sure how many people are with us or if anybody else is joining us today. Um, so, like I said, I'm Catalina. Um, I have been playing here in the SCA for probably about 17 years. I'm going to put this little guy away. Excuse me for a minute. Um, and my persona has taken, <coughs> has evolved over time. Um, once my husband and I got together, we came to a compromise, and that's how I ended up in Kiev in um, what was is the period of the Kievan Rus. So as we go through this, um, this class is the 101 class, so just base, the basics. Um, on Thursday, I'm teaching the 201 class, which gets into some more of the um, decoration, the jewelry, higher classes of um, people wearing different things. This is what you minimally would need to know just to come off as having a authentic presentation. <coughs> um, sorry, I promise I am not sick. Uh, the asthma and my allergies are kicking my butt. So we're going to go ahead and get started. This is the basics. And so the first part is the overview. Can everybody see the screen? Give me a thumbs up if you can see the screen. Okay. Um, Kievan Rus was technically a politic geopolitical time period. Um, it is from the very earliest times when the Vikings or the Scandinavians came over <clears throat> and landed in the Slavic lands and the two started to merge. So that 862 number at the very top of the screen is the very earliest time. Um, way back then, the two peoples were very separate. The trading peoples, the Vikings may have started to adopt some of the Slavic dress in order to assimilate and sell their things, right? Make everybody more comfortable. The time period that I play in, I play in the 12th century <coughs> because I choose not to time travel, although I travel um, from my homelands in England to the um, frozen lands of Novgorod of my husband. Um, but I don't like to time travel because I don't just have like a rabbit hole. There's a war in there already, and I really don't need to time travel and add to my warren. Um, so the time period that I plan or I focus on <coughs> in the 12th century, really there's been a lot of assimilation. The two peoples have really come together, um, and that's where you get a lot of that Slavic influence into what probably was originally a very Scandinavian presentation. Um, this is gonna be a little bit of presentation and a little bit of um, trying to show and tell. So what I'm wearing now is kind of where we're gonna start. Okay, so materials and shapes. Um, most of the materials, now Nov Novgorod and was the center of Kiev. It was the seat of power and it was on the trade route. So I know a lot of people like to say, oh, my things are on the trade route so that they have a lot of access to things. But in this case, um, Novgorod really was a center of trade, especially that far north. So they had linen, of course, from flax, they had hemp fibers, they had wool, but they also had access to cotton earlier than the rest of Western Europe because it came up from um, Byzantium and some of the lands to the south because there was such a good relationship between the princes of Kiev and um, Byzantium. That's where you get that um, the guard that would go down. Um, <clears throat> but in everyday clothing you still saw linen and wool predominantly and then the higher echelon folks you'd see silk. Rus clothing, for the most part, was not particularly form-fitting. Um, it was very geometric construction, um, didn't have the rounded, um, some of those rounded seams and fitted seams that you saw later. Even now, 
um, even into the 16th, 17th, 18th century, the clothing that the royalty wears still has a lot of those same shapes. It's very trapezoidal um, and somewhat rectangular. Instead of the long triangular gores that we're more for, familiar with from the Scandinavian finds as well as from the Western European finds, a lot of the um, <clears throat> gores in the construction are actually rectangular or trapezoidal. So I'm not sure how well you'll be able to see this. I'm going to get up and down a lot. The gore under my arm here is inserted into the sleeve and it's a rectangle at the top. The sleeve gusset inserts into the gore, and then this gore goes all the way down in a trapezoidal fashion, as opposed to the triangle that would be inserted at the hip in some of the other constructions that we see. Class distinctions were the same in Kiev and Russia as they were everywhere else. Of course, the lower classes would have been an unbleached or coarser grades of fabric, whether that be linen or wool, um, hand spun, weaving. As you went up in status, you could afford materials that were dyed, that were printed, that were brocaded of silk, and sometimes of cotton, because cotton was considered a luxury fabric at that time. What I'm wearing right now this is actually not white. <laughs> this is just so old that it has bleached out to what looks to be white. This is my, um, this was one of my first underdresses that I made when I started this, decided to do Roos. It's of natural linen. This one probably came from Joann's um, and is probably that rayon linen blend. Um, but it is held up quite nicely. It's at least eight years old and I wear it on a regular basis. So like I said, this is gonna be a little bit of show and tell. Um, I make my necklines not quite so big that they can get over my head. So you will see rounded necklines, you'll see slit necklines, and the slit was either in the center or it could have been to the side as well. And then annular or penannular pins were very common the same as they were in other parts of Europe. <clears throat> okay, let's get into, we're gonna do women and men. Um, the women were more complicated, so we're gonna start off there. There were five base, basic layers. Um, the base layer was, caught, was your basic chemise or rubica, um, and that's what I basically have on right now. Then you had short overgarments, long wide sleeved overgarments, narrow sleeved overgarments, and then cloak like garments that could have gone over all of the top of it. With the exception of this base layer, everything else is optional and interchangeable. You didn't, you had to have your Rubica, but maybe you would skip then to a long wide sleeve garment as opposed to a shorter one. So the rest of those layers could be mixed and matched. Okay, so base layers. The undergarment was always worn with a belt, even if it was underneath something else. Now, to our modern sensibilities, it's kind of uncomfortable to have a belt underneath of another garment, but it was considered indecent at that time to not have it belted. Um, it could have, lower class women would have worn unbleached linen and may have just worn the rubica. Um, upper classes generally wore this as their base layer with a second one over top. Um, and so this is what I use as my belt. It's just an ankle wo woven belt. As we know, ankle looms aren't period but they produce the same effect as a rigid, um, rigid heddle or a backstrap loom. Um, sometimes the Robica, especially the fancier ones, were embroidered with red um, along the collar, around the sleeves. Um, what's interesting is, is that the poorer women actually would have added a strip of red cloth instead of doing the embroidery, because embroidery took time. 
and time was something that poorer women didn't have. So they would add the fabric as opposed to taking the time to do the fine embroidery on their undergarments. Um, the sleeves are generally long. Now this one is not as long as they could be. You see, they only go to the middle of my hand, but in general, because of the location of this group of people, it was cold. So it, one, could act as a hand warmer, but two, the upper classes of um, people used it to show wealth. So the more wrinkles you had on your sleeves, the more fabric you could afford to waste. Most of, one of the reason that we went roost, so the discussion was, hey honey, what do you want to do? Well, he had an idea. He was going to be from Kiev after the fall to the Mongols because he wanted to be a Russian conscript into the Mongolian army. Here's the thing. That happened in the 1260s. In Western Europe, in the 1200s, clothing had no shape. I am vain enough, and I will admit this, I still have a waist. I like to show my waist. So I told him he had to pick 100 years earlier, which was the 11th century where I could wear a blio, or the 14th century where I could wear a coat hardie, and I still had a waist. Little did I know I'd be wearing a lot more ruse, but at least I have a belt, and I still have a waist. But bonus, especially because we do all the camping, dresses were worn above the ground. Even the rich people, most of their dresses were above the ground, which gave a lot more freedom of movement and not a lot of stuff dragging behind me when I need to do stuff. Because inevitably with two kids, especially when they were younger, my arms were full and picking up dresses at the same time that I was picking up children was not a thing. I'm just gonna try to keep track of time so that I don't go too fast and I don't go too slow. All right, so <clears throat> these are some examples, okay? The one on my far left, that is just a Rubica. Now you can see that one has a stand-up collar, which is also, it's a short one, but it is a stand-up collar that is then attached. Um, I have some of those as well. I use them for my fancier things and when I'm not going to be overwhelmingly warm. Okay, but you can see that one is all one color. It's fairly plain. The one in the center has some added decoration. So this is gonna be that one that's either, that's probably a second Robica because you could wear two. You could wear the one that was very plain as an undergarment like I have on, and then you could add a nicer one on top. So you can see that she has some collar decoration. She has bicep bands. And I believe that in a different picture, she also has some trim at the opening of her sleeves. And then the one on my right, the blue with the red collar. So just a different type of decoration. <clears throat> okay, so second layer. Um, there were three different types. I wear two of them, I don't wear the third. So the first one is a Panova, the second one is, is a Pona, and the third is a Navershnik. Today, right now, I have on my Panova. Um, I'll show you some pictures of it. Basically, it's a two or three panel apron type thing that is strung onto a belt. Um, some sources say that the panels are sewn together at the top. Some sources say that they're free and they, they just glide over the fastening. Um, mine are not attached, so I can move them how I need them. I have used it as an actual apron when I have cooked for feasts. It's delightful because they move everywhere that I want them to because they're separate, so they don't get tied up on my back. Um, the Panova tended, the artifacts tend to show that they were plaid materials, 
don't know why, but that's what they have found. Um, married women tended to wear the panova, just the apron. The reason I don't wear a zapona is because that was more like a tabard type construction. Um, a long piece of fabric or two pieces attached to the shoulder with a cutout for the neck and then belted, but very much like a long tabard um, and usually worn by unmarried women. It's also an older garment um, than the panova. They believe that that's slightly older and was used longer. Um, and then the third is the Navershnik. Now, I am gonna do a little show and tell. So, I'm gonna take off the panova. Some people do wear them under their Navershnik. I find it to be bulky and uncomfortable, and it doesn't make a lot of sense to me if I consider this to be a utilitarian garment. If I consider this to be an apron, then it being under my Navershnik makes no sense because I can't reach it to do anything with it. Um, other people consider it that it was just a modesty garment. I'm not sure if I go with that because to me, it usually served a purpose. So, okay. Then you would have, let's see. So this is a second Robica. You can see this one is more like that center version where it's still fairly plain, but it has some direct, um, some decoration at the collar. And then this is a Navershnik. So it's a little bit wider cut through the body. The sleeves are shorter. So if you'll bear with me one second. This actually does go on over all the things, even my head wrap if I do this correctly. Nope. Okay. So you can see that the sleeves are shorter than my over gown. What you can't see is that the hem is decorated as well as my collar and then my shorter sleeves, and it's all done in the same treatment. So just a different color linen. Um, skipping ahead a little bit, Slavic women in particular always had their heads covered. And we're gonna cover that as in the accessory piece. But they always had their heads covered, which is one of those, you can see the transition from the Scandinavians who may or may not have had their heads covered depending on their status and if they left their braids out or not. Whereas the, the Slavs always had a head covering. This is just a basic head wrap. Um, that I just keep tied. I actually I'm able to wash my hair a lot less when I'm in garb because my hair is always under wraps. In fact, most people don't know me without something on my head. Okay. So in this slide, you can see the Panova. Mine is very much like this right here. It's three panels. It's, I have one solid one in the back and two split in the front. This center one is from a museum. Um, this is just a drawing that I found online. And then this one over here, just the line drawing, it's where I got a lot of my original resource material. It's um, from Mistress Sophia LaRousse. Um, 
She does fantastic work and it should be everybody's place to start if you're looking at doing a Roos persona, especially in the Kievan times and then starting to go into the Moscovite time. There isn't a lot of extant information prior to the 1300s. So there's a lot of extrapolation between the grave finds of the Scandinavians or the Vikings and then the finds in Novgorod, which don't start really until the 1300s. So in that in-between period where we, where I live, there's a lot of kind of piecing things together and making some leaps. Here's the Zapona. Like I said, it's basically a rectangular piece of fabric with a um, hole for your head, a neck hole. And then it could be decorated somewhat on the bottom. You might have a decoration on the fabric and it can be decorated at the neck, but it's just belted at the waist like a tabard would be. And you can see that this, so Sophia LaRusse's um, drawing here, as well as this picture here, the hair is not covered. So this one is up with a headband and this one is entirely down, signifying that both women are unmarried. And then here's the Nabersnick. Um, These are all pictures of my dresses. Um, you can see that they are slightly shorter than the underdress. They have shorter and slightly wider sleeves to allow them to go over top of the underdress. Um, and a little bit wider through the body as well. Additional decoration would have been very common on this layer, whether at the neck, bicep band, the sleeve openings, or at the hem. Um, sometimes you'll see that, um, we'll see in the next slide, sometimes these got very fancy. And um, the wealthier you were, of course, the more time and money you can put into the fabrics. Here's where we start getting into some of the, so this is the third layer. The first two layers would have been something that you would have seen with people who were in the country, were slightly poorer, um, even into the townspeople. They were your two most common layers. You're not really going to see these long, wide sleeved overgarments like the Dalmatica until you get to people who have more money. One, there wasn't really a reason to have that many layers. This is your fancy layer. It wasn't really a layer to keep warm. It was a layer to show off. Okay, your, the sleeves were wider. They were shorter. They showed off the fabric underneath. You see a lot of printing or brocading, um, especially in the murals. So that's where we're getting some of this information is the murals that came from the 11th and 12th century on the walls of um, Kiev and Rus cities, as well as some of the mosaics. So you will see materials that either look like they are brocaded or that have been printed in some way. And there is evidence of um, <clears throat> block printed fabrics during this time. Sometimes you will see these Dalmaticas um, belted, but other times and very often you will see them not belted. This is a garment that was also very common in Byzantium and that you see a lot of back and forth between the Kievan Rus and um, Byzantium at this time. This is where we get into, so this layer, we'll call it layer four, but like I said, layer three might not have been available to everybody. Layer four is the thing that kept you warm. So a lot of, everybody would have had some type of covering like this. Um, it might not have been fancy, but it kept you warm. So usually of wool, even if it was a lighter wool, um, it could have been lined with fur for the cold winters. And there is indication that there was an opening part of the way down. So what's interesting is in the Vikings have, you know, we know the prototypical Viking coat, right? So it's big, it has a slit 
all the way down and then it crosses over and is either belted or has some type of clasp. And then in the Moscovite roost, you again in that later period see coats that are fully open down the front as well as the sleeves that don't actually go on the arm but actually just flop. But this in-between period, the openings on all of the coats did not go all the way down. They stopped about halfway and then they were either tied closed or used some sort of clasp system with a loop and a toggle or a small button and a loop, not button holes, but some sort of loop closure. Okay, and they called this a spita. Um, I have two different types. So this is kind of my in-between garment. It's kind of almost sh shaped like a navershnik, but it is blanket coat wool, so it is very warm. And I wear it as a slightly fancier um, outer layer. Or I also have this. And this is actually upholstery wool. And this is more like the Speeda in this um, drawing and in this picture. The sleeves are very long. They're fairly narrow. Um, they go well down over my fingertips if I don't fold them back. Um, it does not have toggles down the center because I was making it quickly before. Um, I don't remember exactly, but I know that I used it the year that Gulf Wars was 26 degrees one morning and I had all the wool on and I was comfy. So um, it's not lined with wool. I don't need anything or lined with fur. I don't need anything quite that warm. Okay, and then we end up with cloaks. Um, they could be wool, they could be silk, they could be light, they could be heavy. You can see the one in this mural photo. You can see what I mean by the either the printing or the brocading. Okay, and then you can see trim along the top and down. Most of these appear to be fairly rectangular and not like the cloaks that you see in Western Europe past the 13th century, which were round and that getting into that full circle or half circle. These tend to be more rectangular. Um, sometimes they were directly over, they could be folded in half like a cape and then pinned in the center. They could be, as this one is, pinned at the shoulder and then leaving one arm open. They were very versatile. Um, mine has now been passed to a friend as they were elevated, but definitely a very versatile garment. I could use it as a cloak or a blanket. Um, the fancier ones you will see as you did in the 12th century in Western Europe, where there might have been a chain in between the two sides to allow it to just rest on the shoulders, but that you would have seen in very, in the princely classes in Kiev at this time. All right, now let's talk about the guys. Not quite as many layers. Um, basically, your first layer was always going to be pants and an under tunic. Then you, I combined um, what Sophia said was layers two and three, light and heavy over tunics. It's an over tunic. You could wear one that was lighter and then one was heavier. You might just wear a heavier one. You might just wear a lighter one. You could wear two under tunics if one is one that definitely was a body garment as opposed to one that was slightly nicer but still linen that you just wore over top. So again, a lot of interchangeability between these garments. Okay, so again, they call it the rubica. Um, and then the pants were porty. So a lot of times we see the guys, um, the folks doing Norse with the very big baggy pants. That is not what you would have seen in Kiev during this time. Porty were narrow and usually tucked into the boots or they were wrapped at the calf with um, leg wraps, 
whichever word you want to use for the leg wraps. Um, and sometimes a type of gaiter went on top of them instead of a boot in case of the very wealthy classes in Novgorod. The under tunics were, would have been linen or wool, just like for the women. Um, and then wealthy men could have worn a second fine wool or a silk tunic over that base layer. This group of, so this picture, there's a group in um, Poland. It's a, and they call themselves the Drutsina, and I can't pronounce the rest of it. But if you find them on Facebook, their representation is not necessarily Kievan Rus, but it is time appropriate Slavic. Their representation of what you would have found in the Kievan Rus era and place is spectacular for the men and for the women. Okay, layer two, again, this is the over tunic, whether that's a light one, as you can see in this picture of the couple, this is either printed or brocaded silk. So not a heavy over tunic, a light one, but very decorative, showing wealth. Um, or this one is made out of wool and of course slightly heavier. And again, could have ranged from being very utilitarian to very decorative depending on status. Um, additional decoration could have been at the sleeve openings, the hems, bicep bands, or on the collar. And the decoration didn't always match. Um, to our modern sensibilities, like we like to have everything match, but it was possible that there would have been one trim on the hem and a different trim at the sleeve openings or at the collar, depending on what, what was available and what they liked at the time. And then again, cloaks. You can see the construction of this one a little bit better than in the pictures. Um, both of the construction is a little more rectangular. Um, this one over here has some um, there was another picture of it. It has some triangular construction in order to open up the bottom a little bit, but this one is very much a rectangular construction. Large clasps or fibulas either in the middle of the chest or towards the shoulder again. <clears throat> All right, now getting into basic accessories for everybody, for the men and for the women. 7.33, okay, I'm going a little bit faster than I wanted to. Um, so basic accessories, shoes. So we are lucky in the fact that, um, not sure how many of you have ever looked at the museums from Novgorod or some of the extant finds. These three pictures of shoes, the boot and the, the tall boot, the lower boot, and then the shoe are all finds from Novgorod, and they are leather, and they're extant, and they are perfectly preserved because the soil layers, the pH of the soil layers allowed for the leather goods to be preserved. And so the stratifications, they have dug down an incredible, I think, 60 feet volume, am I correct on that? About 60 feet? I know that it's 25 years every layer of the road. Uh, I'm not sure yeah. the actual. Okay. So there's a tremendous amount of stratification that they have, what they would do is as the road started to sink and things started to decay, they would just build another layer and then another layer. So they've excavated it and found an incredible amount. Um, colored, and then they did have colored leather for the shoes. In some of the murals and the mosaics, you will find both red and yellow leathers for boots. Um, among the poor and in some of the rural areas, they would make shoes or stuff their shoes with bast fibers. So plant fibers because they couldn't afford the leather or did not have the animal skins in order to make shoes themselves. 
So the very poor would use bast fibers. Um, of course, those with more wealth and had the opportunity would use leather as a preferred material. All right, and now into hats and headdresses. This, just this section is exhaustive. <laughs> there is more information on Roos headdresses that you could put into a three hour class. This is just the bare surface. Um, like I said, the Slavic women and then the Rus women, once they were married, they always covered their heads. This was probably the bare minimum. Um, though this is probably slightly earlier style, you can see most of these women do not have a large bun at the back of their head like I do today. I let my daughter borrow my caps and they have now disappeared. So I have to make new ones. Um, but they are very similar almost to a St. Birgitta cap, except they don't have that line of stitching down the center. So basically just a piece of fabric that covered the head and a band, and it was gathered in the front and gathered in the back. And that created that base layer for other things to go over. It covered the hair. Once the hair was covered for women, there was an inordinate amount of ways that you could then cover the rest of this. When it is very warm, I go like this, or when I am very casual or feeling really lazy. Um, with this, even when I'm being somewhat casual, I usually have my headband on with a set of temple rings. Now, like I said, the Slavic tribes assimilated with the Scandinavians. But one thing that definitely was distinctive in all the different areas where the different Slavic tribes had been were their temple rings. I do not know all of them by sight, but there's a bunch of them. This is the set that I usually wear. I'll try to get that close to the camera. You can see it's got three wider spaces. Sometimes they'll have five. Um, this one has some imprints on them. This is a style specific to Novgorod um, and a couple other places. This is the one that I wear the most. Um, another style, and forgive me, I do not remember, and since this was the basic class, I didn't go hunting for it. This is another form. It's just a spiral. There, you can see it a little bit better. They were large, they were small, they hooked onto a headband. So this was a different one. Um, and I don't have my other ones here, but you can see in this picture with the woman in the red headband, I think these are the Red Michi temple rings. These simple circular ones were also worn by different people in different places. And then you also have, you see these over in this picture that has a lot of the different, these are um, sometimes called Kulti. So they're slightly different in the fact that they weren't solid pieces of metal that were shaped. They were usually round, but two pieces attached to each other and hollow in the center. And then sometimes they were engraved or enameled with pictures on the outside. They tended to be worn by people of a higher status. But, so you can see this, this, um, the girl with the blue head wrap, she has the cap on underneath, that's this white piece under there. And then this piece here is either a headband piece like this that has been stiffened without a top, or some of them were almost like pillbox hats, and they had a solid top over it. And then she would put the veil over top of that. So if I were going to do it with the headband, I would just wrap this around. 
Mine are always able to be tied at the back so that I can fit them on different size headdresses depending on what I'm wearing that day. So the way she has hers wrapped, is just, she has hers down like this, pulled down tight, and then wrapped around her neck. This way, with then a second band around to hold it in place. The other way to do it is the way I tend to use more often, which is the woman on my far left. She has a very elaborate, because I think what I'm seeing here is one underneath, she's got one tied here and then one that's going around her head. And you can see that her stitches here are of a different color. They're not white. Sometimes they would have used red stitches in or because that was a color that they used a lot for decoration. So this one, would come down and this one is especially good if I'm cold because then I'm not but up and around and then back down again and then I would put the headband on top of that But that was one thing that you definitely saw across the board, regardless of station. It's just that it might have been a plain woven band. It might have been a band stiffened with um, birch bark, the same that they use for writing letters and that type of material to stiffen it, like this one. And then these are. These are slightly different where there's just the decorated headband with the wrap. And this is a cap, which I did not bring downstairs. I have one similar to that as well. Um, for the winter, I also have this, which is so large because I made it too big, but it actually works. It fits over all of the things and it's very warm it's wool and fur which would have been something that would have been appropriate to the time and those are my resources um does anybody have any questions oh hold on let's see so we were talking about men's clothing. So you can see that the men's Robica would have been very similar, just shorter, obviously. And with those same trapezoidal gores into the construction, instead of a triangular gore coming from lower down. So it actually allows um, the use of fabric is actually not very wasteful because it's more um, more rectangular. It's easier for me to do. It did take me a minute to figure out getting the gussets into the gores. Um, and then the other layers. So this would have been, this is a decorated over tunic for a man. Same type of thing, bicep bands, the um, sleeve openings in the collar. Would it be possible to see the under sleeve where you did that trapezoidal gore? Sure. Let me see. If you're done showing the slides, you could blow yourself up so we could see it better. Okay. All right, let me figure this one out. Um, 
Any ideas? If you, you want. should be able to end the screen share. Yep. Uh, go to the top I'll of the share. screen. There we go. And then if you hit the top of the screen where it says speaker view, you should, since you're the primary speaker, you should be able to uh, blow yourself you up to the computer. That's in your own thing. Uh, you mm -hmm. can switch between speaker view and gallery view on your own um, Zoom thing individually. There I am. Okay, anyway. So let me take this off the hanger. All right. So this, it's hard to see on the white. Let me see if, hold on. I have a different color one, it'll work better. Or maybe, can you see this one on the blue? The problem is, is that there's not contrasting. So where a lot of the Norse garments were made with contrasting stitching colors, none of the Roos finds have found a contrasting stitch color. And so all of the thread is exact same color, so it's hard to see. Um, let's see. Here, this one. Big stitches, because it's blanket wool. Let's see. I'm gonna try to do this. Can you see that at all? Yes, that's much better. Okay, so let's see. So is it like a traffic oh. Right here, this is part of the gore. This is the gusset. So the gusset is still a, it's a square and it gets inserted into this trapezoid that is actually one piece. It's just, so your trapezoid is like this and then it's slit down the center for the same length as your gusset. And then you attach your gusset to your sleeve first. No. That attach. sounds terrible, is what that sounds like. It's actually not that bad once you get used to it. But I will tell you, it's still like I look at it and then I have to look at it again and then I go on with it. But once you get used to it, it's actually not as bad. And I actually like doing the trapezoidal gusset gores better now than triangles. Because with the triangle, you always end up with the weird little amount at the top. <laughs> it either gets stuck into your outer seam or it never lines up right. But and isn't my, that um, what you're kind of doing with that when you put the gusset in the slit in the trapezoid? You're now doing exactly the thing that drives me crazy when sticking the triangle gore in the slit. No, I actually okay. have never had that problem because what you do is, so how I put it together is I attach the gusset to the gore first. And then do that to the sleeve. And then I attach the sleeve to the whole, and then I attach it to the sleeve and do the whole thing in one big line. So I do all the little work first instead of adding in the gusset and the gore afterwards. Because you could, you could put the sleeve on the rectangular part of the body and then add the gusset and then add the gore. Oh yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Never do that. No, but I'm saying, but even when you do it the way you're talking about, you've put, you've got your, you can't see me handwriting, okay, but you've got your trapezoid, you do the little slit in the middle, and you're still sticking that triangle in the middle of that slit. So that's it's the actually thing that not is a, crazy. It is fiddly, but it's still not as bad for me as a triangular gore. And I do triangular gores with my 12th century stuff especially the ones in the back where it's not a piece, right? And then I have to stick it up the center of the slit and then it never ends up right. And I've got this little fiddly bit on my butt. That's why I, <laughs> that's why I cut them in half and make an extra seam because I'm that kind of lazy. So, um, 
So I showed you the, these temple rings. Now, I didn't talk a lot about the other jewelry. If you were above, like if you're in town, if you are not super poor and super rural, you're gonna have some type of jewelry on. Most people did, even if it was just a basic old fashioned arm ring passed down, right, from grandma and the Vikings, right? You would have had an arm ring. Um, I wear mine all around my wrist, but what they did find a lot of, and then I have a fancier one, still not the cuffs that they would have found in the Kievan Rus. They have found this. This is very much, I got lucky. I was at Gulf Wars at one of the merchants that had all the things and I found this and it is so similar to one of the extant finds that I will, I better never lose it. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> it even has the heart shape engraving on it that they found on the extant finds or that similar kind of shape. Um, but this is very similar. It's a hinged cuff. And this is something that was found huh. during that time period as a piece of jewelry. They make, they're wonderful because it keeps my sleeves from going down over my hands, right? Because you make the sleeves long, but then what happens if you don't wear something that closes around them, then your bracelets fall down your wrist under your sleeve. You can't see the bracelets and your hands are flopping in the sleeves all the time. So I have that one, but then I also have this. Um, there's lots of these out there, but I use this and then take one of my smaller ring, my smaller bands, and just tighten it around the end of my sleeve so that it tucks my, it holds my sleeve in place and it won't move. This is the big one, so it doesn't work as well. But Ivan made me a bunch that just go ahead and squeeze around my wrist. Um, as far as they found lots and lots of necklaces too. And they the necklaces didn't have to be super expensive pieces. They did find metal beads. They have stone beads. They have found glass beads. They have, right, and you have the pretty, like the Viking type beads. They would have found those. They also found amber um, and what are basically cowrie shells. So um, I recreate, there's one in a museum that I recreated with amber beads and cowrie shells that is an extant find. I use it when I wear my very early period stuff, when I'm at Penzik on the field and I'm only wearing an unbleached Rubica and, you know, Piece. I'm being super lazy that day. Um, one of the symbols that you would have seen a lot of for the women was this shape, the Lunasa. This is a woman shape. Um, most of these were found in a metal. This just happens to be from Cadnan Marie. This was the site token from Cadnan Marie's coronation. Um, so it went on to the necklace. The other shape, one of the other shapes they found a lot of were those double circles and found them strung like this. Um, the open work metal beads, some crystal beads, and there are a lot of examples of different necklaces that were found. And if you look up Kievan Rus jewelry, um, archaeological finds. You can find tons of it. Um, I know Pinterest is sometimes hard to use because you get swamped with a whole bunch of stuff that you can't use. However, they have some great pins from the actual museums and the extant finds, especially specific to the Kiev and Rus stuff. And um, on Pinterest, and then you can follow the links. You get a lot of folks from Eastern Europe who are doing like the Woolen Festival and some of the Living History Festivals over there where they are very, because it's such a small time period and location, 
that they are focusing on, their things are very authentic and it looks so unified, right? In the SCA, we have a lot of people doing very, very authentic things, but sometimes when you have, say, 12th century Kievan Rus next to the 16th century Elizabethan woman, you don't get quite the same vibe because it's not that big overall perfect picture. Um, but if you look up the Wolin Festival too, W-O-L-I-N, it's set in Poland, but because there's such a heavy Russian and Slavic influence, you'll see a lot of great examples of wonderful clothing. Are there any questions that I can answer? On Thursday, I'll be doing the 201 class where we're gonna talk more about some of the other materials, some of more jewelry, getting into some of the fancier stuff. But I'm happy, we've got about four minutes left. I'm happy to answer any questions or direct you to places you can find stuff or send you some resources. Or if anybody wants to translate Russian for me, I've got articles. There's some questions in the chat. I don't know if... Oh, look at that. Okay. Let's see. Um, uh, Sammy, when you said kind of like a Roman tunica, what was that in regards to? That was in regards to the um, the women's overlayer, where it was literally just the rectangular piece and then belted. Did you see the picture once I posted it of the Zapona, where it's more like a tabard? I did. So it's not quite, I do Roman stuff too. And the Roman stuff is super, super wide. And then it's gathered in at the waist with a belt. The Zapona is cut only like shoulder width. Right. Just for like, yeah, you know, just I was curious like how it related because I make garb. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, by the time, so that, I think things got a lot more related to the Byzantines once you got past, because there's such a, a, a switch in time period, um, from the Western Romans and then switching over to the Eastern Romans. And yes, when you're right, the Zapona mostly unmarried women. And could I write out the name of the Polish group? Sure. Let me find it. Hold on one second. It, I only find it in my Facebook. And every time I do, I have to go through all of my likes to find it. So I am typing it now. There is an accent on this, but I don't have my accent key set up. and I definitely can't pronounce Polish. So there you go. I know it's Drutsina, and then I don't know how to pronounce the rest of it, but their stuff is wonderful, and they have a fantastic photographer who does all of their portraitry, and they also, if anybody's interested, they do some World War I and 18th century stuff as well. So they're a, um, a group that does paid I don't want to say performances, but <clears throat> let's see. Um, interpretations. I'm sorry? Paid interpretations. Yes, but almost like demos. Right, but instead of saying, when you say performance, interpretation is the yes. nicer living history way to say it. So the string type of temple rings, a large string. Yes. Um, so the dangly ones, some of those um, that were more like the culty, I've seen those almost like very tiny um, chain. And then at the bottom attached to a culty, I've seen separate layers of beads. That's definitely one. If you, my um, Pinterest page is under Catalina Ivania. And if you go and find it, I have, so be prepared for my Warren, because there are folders inside of folders, even in my Pinterest. Um, just so that you know that. I don't do that at all. 
Um, good place for finding patterns. Uh, Sophia LaRousse is where I got my original patterns. And from there, I've just kind of, I don't, I don't draw a lot of patterns, um, especially because it's mostly rectangular construction. So I don't have to draw out some of those lines that I would maybe for a code hardy or some of the things that have a curved sleeve. I'm able to mostly just draw it straight onto my fabric using the measurements that I draw that I get. Um, but there are, yes, there are good diagrams on Sophia LaRousse's webpage. Oh yeah, and that's the, the One Woolen Festival page, Sammy. Yep, I went digging. <laughs> so something I'm yeah, kind of curious digging. about, um, <laughs> something I'm kind of curious about because you mentioned the different hierarchical levels in um, the Roost culture. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how they relate to how we play in the SCA. So um, let's take my persona, for example. One reason that I chose, <laughs> I gave Ivan no choice about Novgorod was the fact that in Novgorod there were women who were allowed to be intelligent they owned businesses, they owned property, and they were literate. <laughs> so, um, but the, our backstory was that he is part of the prince's retinue. He's part of that Jutsina. So the highest rank at that time was the princely rank, and then their family members, and then spreading out from there. So then you would have had the, so the princely, class, the noble class, and the Drutsina, and then you would have gone into the townspeople and some of those business people, and then spreading out into the country. Um, so kind of stratified in a similar fashion, but where we have a king and a queen, they kind of had their different princes of different places, and at that time, Kiev was the powerhouse. Um, Abby, second layer garments, linen or wool or either, either one, depending on what you needed them for. Um, I had, <laughs> I had, well, I guess it was first layer. It was also wool. Valya has it now. It's really nice. Um, it's tan wool. It's trimmed in red silk. I shrank it. It went to her. <laughs> or Ivan shrank it. I don't remember which one of us shrank it, but they, all of the layers could have been any of the fabrics. You wouldn't have seen silk as a base layer because that was just a little too extravagant, right? And hard to wash. So even the highest class people would have been using probably linen against the skin or wool because wool doesn't hold odor, but, and then washing it out. Wool, actually, if you wear wool against your skin, even if you sweat in it, it will release the odors. Now, I don't wear wool against my skin because itchy, and I can't afford wool that is not itchy, <laughs> right? That would be some really nice wool. Um, but yeah, any of the layers can be any of the fabrics. <laughs> So class time is technically over. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Um, if you have any questions before Thursday, feel free to shoot them over on Messenger to me. Um, I'm on Facebook, Catalina and Vanya. If you, I'll keep a tab on both my friends' messages and those, the ones that get lost in the message requests for those of you who aren't friends with me on Facebook. Um, and let me know if there's anything specific, if you're coming back for the second class, if there's anything specific that in that like more in depth, because we're gonna be looking more at decoration and jewelry and specifics of head wrapping and specifics of temple rings and that type of thing, um, the different types of shoes, the cutouts in the shoes, and 
kind of delving a little bit deeper instead of just talking about the layers. So if there are specific things that you're interested in or you want answers to, um, shoot me a message so that I can be prepared. <laughs> I don't like not knowing because then I have to go look for the answer anyway. All right. So thank you so much for everybody for coming. I appreciate it. Um, hope to talk to everybody soon and let me know. Oh, my Facebook name is the same as the name that um, is under the class. I am a teacher in real life, so everything is very, very separate. So I am Catalina Ivania everywhere. Facebook, Pinterest, um, my Gmail, my email account is Catalina Ivania at Gmail. Everything is the same name on this side of life. Thank you so much for being here.